Fine. So this is our uh, this uh, mock test. Uh, my name is Dr. Munjal Pandya, and uh, I mean I'm the founder of Medical MCQ for all for last ten years, and I'm myself is uh, by profession uh, hemat oncologist and bone marrow transplant fellow, and by passion I'm a aggressive coach as well. So this is what the quick slide we are providing Prometric thousand MCQ book. We recently launched our ebook as well. So those who are interested, they can get the ebook as well. Online subscription, online coaching, daily live lectures. What we are doing and taking today, such kind of lectures taken every day by our team. An expert. We have six seven doctors. I will introduce very quickly one by one. Meanwhile, we will start our uh, this lecture. So that is the thing. Uh, next thing is a, a WhatsApp subscription. We launch also a WhatsApp subscription. So you get every day 25 MCQ on your WhatsApp, right? Regularly with answers and explanations. So many people are already joined it. We also conduct the Oman Viva and Oman Viva coaching. And we have a lot of subscription for Oman Viva. Data flow service is also one short shot, excellent money back guarantee package we introduced for last few months and years and we have a mobile application on android and iphone so those who did not download it i request those you are using uh, download it it's very important and very excellent whole the website can be accessed from the uh, mobile application on both the platform right so this is myself not going much in detail uh, quickly i did my mbbs i did my fellowship in hemat oncology and bone marrow transplant training from one of the premier institute in italy rome uh, I have more than 15 years of experience treating blood disease, cancers, and all hematology uh, from benign to malignant, and more than 10 years of coaching experience. I treated almost more than 100,000 patients so far in last 22 years. Uh, this is Dr. Arti, consultant pediatrician in my team, right? She is a gold medalist and she is regularly taking the class, so she probably join us for the pediatric mock test next time. Dr. Maddy, she is based at Oman. She is a emergency physician. Excellent internal medicine lady. Uh, so she is in our team taking regular lectures daily. Dr. Sikha, who is going to take lecture back to back me. She is also a consultant gynecologist and uh, practicing in a premier institute in India now. And uh, this guy is uh, Ankit Patel, who is a consultant gastroenterologist, a super specialist. He did his MBBS. He did his MD. He did his diploma national board. It's the highest accreditation. And he's a consultant gastroenterologist. And uh, this is Meghna, who is in Dubai now. So she's taking care of data flow. So that's it. This is all our contact details. We recently launched our ProMetric 1000 MCQ books. Those who are interested, you can go and get it. That's it. So just come to the main crux of the talk. Now everyone gets very much clear cut. I'll give you 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Think over it and give the proper answer. Consider this is your real exam right don't avoid any questions try to put your answers this all questions honestly speaking absolutely high yield we picked up every sunday we pick up so definitely you will going to see on your screen in your exam believe me so just be more serious try to assess your score i have a 10 12 15 questions you write down the question answer question answer and end of the session you know that how much is right and wrong if, he, if your score is less than 50%, don't take it otherwise. But honestly speaking, you need to work a little more hard next four to six or eight weeks before going for the exam. Right? So this is not very complicated or very, very toxic questions. It is a middle level questions. Not easy, not very, very difficult. Right? But this type of questions will usually come in exam. So let's concentrate here and let's move and jump to the next first question. First questions in front of your screen. Which of the following medication is a most associated with QT prolongation? Chlorpromazine, clozapine, haloperidol, olanzapine, quetapine, and zipracidone. Take 30 seconds as exam, 35 seconds, 40 seconds. I want each and everybody to post the answer. So far, there is no no answer, no A B C D E F.
एनी कॉमेंट डॉक्टर खादीजा डॉक्टर खादीजा एनी कॉमेंट सो एक्चुअली आई रिमेम्बर इट टू बी क्वाइट पेन सी डोंट वरी एट ऑल राइट और रॉन्ग स्पीक अप समथिंग यू अंडरस्टैंड वाई आई एम टेलिंग यू वंस यू डेवलप दिस देन योर फियर विल गो अवे डोंट वरी हियर आई एम नॉट हियर टू फाइंड योर मिस्टेक और एनी वंस मिस्टेक दिस इज एब्सोल्युटली अ लर्निंग प्लेटफॉर्म एंड बिलीव मी यू विल नॉट गेट सच प्लेटफॉर्म एनीवेयर नोबडी विल डू हार्ड वर्क फॉर ऑन संडे और टू थ्री आवर्स फॉर यू एट नो कॉस्ट सो ट्राई टू यूटिलाइज इट ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड डोंट वरी सो नाउ व्हाट डू यू थिंक व्हाट डू यू थिंक व्हाई यू हैव क्विटापिन you you somewhere read quitapin yes i remember reading it somewhere fair enough so now today is your homework go and do it what is quitapin and drop me the message today or tomorrow you have 24 hours of time you need to read quitapin is what what kind of drug no i don't need you to do phd what you need to know which group of drug antipsychotic right what is a just simple mechanism of action what is the indication of using this drug and side effect they are interested in only two things in psychiatric question where you use it and what is the commonest side effect of the drug or what is the fatal side effect of the drug is that clear to you yes or no yes sir yes. right so this is your homework yes abhij abindas yes abin yes sir yes what's your comment sir uh in my memory ंगे right so beginning of q q to beginning of t is called as a qt interval qt interval so this is normal qt interval right and this is prolonged qt interval right so prolonged qt interval is what what is implication what does it do when there is a prolonged in, in uh, qt interval so correct answer is f so those who have not given the answer make it wrong in your book i don't want to tell what is your answer but you assess yourself end of the day ziprasidone is the atypical antipsychotic drug that is mostly associated with the qt prolongation right and uh, chlorpromazine is typical antipsychotic with severe sedative so all drugs you have six drugs you have right if i can go back to the slide so here the answer is a right this is the answer right here the qt prolongation right now if you see qt prolongation so what are the other clozapine so if they ask you the clozapine what is the side effect of clozapine clozapine cbc clozapine cbc clozapine cbc mug up clozapine cbc and in cbc you have a reduced neutrophil count so a granulocytosis is a medical emergency a means absence and granulocytosis means granulocyte that is wbc so when you are giving clozapine to any patient you need to do a baseline cbc right and you need to make sure that neutrophil is normal right the potential and bad side effect of clozapine is agranulocytosis it's a medical emergency and if this patient develop fever it is called febrile neutropenia and you have to administer the antibiotic that's it this is logic it's our day to day practice in hematology but clozapine i'm not using much but this is one of the bad side effects so you must know so they may not ask you what is prolonged prolonged qt intervention if they ask prolonged qt intervention this is answer but they ask which of the following drug can cause a granulocytosis so this is another mcq in exam clozapine third haloperidol dobutabine right so haloperidol potential antipsychotic extra pyramidal side effect extra pyramidal side effect is haloperidol right this is third question in exam fourth question olanzapine what does olanzapine do so olanzapine increase the triglycerides so it is not good idea to give in cardiac patients right or not in a very badly dyslipidemia patient somnolence hyperglycemia so you should be uh, cautious so this all three things are present in diabetic patient diabetic patient they have high sugar they most of them they are obese and they have bad lipid profile so somebody with obese hyperglycemic and hyper dyslipidemic it's not good idea to give olanzapine try to avoid it right 
and uh, is incorrect right so this is how you have to do it right you don't need to mug up right so this is all the questions we covered in one question right so now you need to know that okay clo close up in a granulocytes is cbc is the baseline here extra pyramidal side effects somnolence and this so you need to know the basic side effects of all i will share whole the powerpoint and video presentation by evening so no need to mug up you just concentrate what i'm trying to explain you got it is that clear is that clear doctor dr tarik are you clear right so so this is how we have you can make your surgery much right. safer Spend the nutshell. so i have to leave all great so i'll switch on the next questions when you want to speak to me or interact you just do it you unmute your mic right i make it mute temporarily because background noise qt interval is prolonged if it is more than 440 milliseconds in a man and 460 millisecond in a woman so i i give a little literature what is qt interval right already i'll show you what is qt interval so you can measure it in terms of the seconds right so sometimes you attend our ECG lectures as well. So you get better clarity with PQRST and related abnormalities. But meanwhile, you just remember, right? 415 male and 416 female, anything more than this, it's a prolonged. And greater QTC interval, more than 500, right? More than 500. If you have more than 500 associated with increased risk of torsadi pointers. Again, we heard thousands of time torsadi pointers. But we never know what is torsadi pointer. We are monotonously reading and listening and reading and listening torsadi pointer. So let me clarify you today what is torsadi point or torsadi pointers. So torsadi points is a specific type of ventricular tachycardia, VT, ventricular tachycardia. And another term is a ventricular fibrillation. So this is ventricular tachycardia. Or fast heart rate that begins in your heart ventricle. You can get it if you inherit QT prolongation. So if you have long QT prolongation, you may get a bad ventricular tachycardia, right? It is two way. If you treat it well, good prognosis. If you don't treat it on time, it will be a fatal. So there are extremities, right? So in right. So what is the torsadi pointer? Torsadi pointer is a specific type of arrhythmia, especially ventricular tachycardia. Fast heart rhythm originate in the ventricle. You can get it if you inherited the QT syndrome. So some people have a long QT prolongation, right? So some drugs you can avoid, right? So before giving the Zasperidone, you need to do the baseline ECG of the patient. If this patient has a prolonged QT and on top of that, you are giving the drug antipsychotic, he will die. Not because of psychotic illness, because of the drug side effect, right? So this is important. If you take a certain medicine, although torsadi pointers can be deadly if untreated, treatment generally improves the outlook. And complication of torsadi pointers or bad ventricular tachycardia is number one fatal ventricular fibrillation, syncope, sudden cardiac death. So this is bad condition. No? When somebody is dying with the drug or with their side effect, it's a bad side effect, right? So this is what the important high yield points is that, right? So you need to keep in mind, just don't need to mug up the answer. You need to know what is QT interval, what is the normal range of QT interval, and what is the torsadi pointers and how we going to treat it. So that's it. This is what the thing is, right? So this is the literature related. And one more thing, long QT syndrome can cause sudden fainting and seizures. Young people with QT syndrome have increased risk of sudden death. Treatment for long QT interval includes lifestyle changes and medication to prevent dangerous heartbeats. So basically you need to, if somebody has, you need to give some antiarrhythmic, probably the beta blocker, right? And sometimes surgery is indicated right or implant a device is to control the heart rhythm like pacemaker or some defibrillator intra ventricular defibrillators are available so just go and check it out but this is the simple logic so this is your right or wrong you know you keep in your notes that this is right or wrong second question in front of your screen a 46 years old japanese american woman present to her primary care physician with a complaint of increased shortness of breath Forty chest pain, abdominal distension, fainting spell. She has a history of amyloidosis for which she has been repeatedly hospitalized. Her EKG shows low voltage QRS complex. Her vital signs are stable. Her laboratory values are normal. 
which of the following would be the most helpful in the establishing the correct diagnosis following is the most likely diagnosis so we'll discuss this question so what they eventually ask right nobody will give you a clue in the exam i'm just giving you the clue so what they are asking is which of the following would be the most helpful in establishing the diagnosis so they need to know the diagnosis by doing something you confirm the diagnosis that okay fine this could be a diagnosis right so i want one volunteer i will ask as I told you, this is, this is, I am, don't take it otherwise, but I am saying Munjal stride. In that sense, you need to know investigation, right? This is stride. You need to know diagnosis and you need to know treatment. So every MCQ, you need to know three things. Investigation, diagnosis, treatment. So I need the same thing for here from one volunteer, I'll tell. So, right? So what is diagnosis? How you investigate and how you treat the patient. So you need to ask yourself every MCQ, there is three things. What is the diagnosis in this question? Okay, how do I investigate this patient? Okay, once I make a diagnosis of this patient, how am I going to treat this patient? That's it. If you know the art of developing this, at least you get three questions. So if you are solving 50 MCQ, you are solving 150 MCQ. Why? Because you are doing three exercises in one MCQ. Diagnosis, investigation, treatment. So one MCQ, three. 50 MCQ, 150. That's it. So this is a smart work. So, so so answer now. Take 10, 15, 30 seconds. I am not in hurry. Out of 30 people, I get only 3, 4 answers. Considered in that way, if the same question will come in exam, what will you post? Post the answer. That's it. Forget about others' answer. Try to understand the question and try to. Yes, Dr. Javith, any, any comment from your side, Dr. Javith? Dr. Javith, are you there? Dr. Azil? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, are you okay? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Let's little discuss this questions two minutes. What do yes, you think? Sir. What is the diagnosis of this patient out of these three? Sir, um, I don't know, sir, because I cannot connect amyloidosis with these symptoms. No, no. Uh, so, what, what's your diagnosis? Diagnosis is not clear in this scenario. Sir, I think it's some cardiac abnormality, sir. Okay, so some cardiac abnormality by your sense. Cardiac abnormality. Okay. What do you think they are asking the diagnosis or some investigation? So by doing cardiac abnormality, how do you know the cardiac abnormality? By ex cardiac enzyme or CT scan of abdomen or by echocardio or you do potassium or you do x-ray? How you get to know? So, but cardiac enzymes will tell us only about myocardial infarction. Mm -hmm. So, so do but, you think this patient has a myocardial infarction? No, I don't think it's myocardial infarction, sir. Okay, so I remove this option. So, this is not an answer probably, right? Yes, Fair sir. Enough. So, this is again a very important learning point. Sometimes it's possible that you don't know the answer. But if you exclude now one by one, this is not, this is not, this is not, this is not, then remaining is the answer. You understand? This is another art of getting the correct answer. Got it? So cardiac okay, enzyme is gone, right? Yes. Now yes, sir. CT scan of abdomen will help you in this considering the scenario. No, sir. No, sir. So by your sense, this is also gone. So yes, out sir. of this eco potassium and X-ray. Sir, uh, echocardiogram. I I I think echocardiogram will be useful, but they have already mentioned that uh, ECG shows low voltage QRS complexes. So, so doing it again. So what? Why this low voltage is low in QRS complex? Constructive, sir. Sorry, constructive pericarditis. It has a low voltage uh, QRS complex. Rather constructive, sir. Better word is restrictive. Okay. Right. 
so yeah, yeah. so 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 this is uh, you are going well as well absolutely well so now again dissect the questions once again see every line everything is important everything is correlated with each and everything when i'll retrospectively tell you now you understand oh sir it's very easy now see the 46 years of old woman primary healthcare physician complaining of increased shortness of breath probably the ejection fraction is low patient is in cardiac failure that is why breathlessness fatigue patient has a chest pain and abdominal distension right fainting again because of congestive cardiac failure patient may not pump the blood well to the brain that is could be the reason history of amyloidosis is extremely important amyloidosis is what it's like multiple myeloma and amyloidosis so amyloid protein protein that gets deposited in the myocardium so this is the heart right this is the heart so it gets deposited in the myocardium so it won't allow the proper ejection fraction or pumping of the heart to the patient right so it is a not obstructive it is a restrictive disease obstructive means what hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy thickening of the wall right there may be a mitral stenosis tricuspid stenosis this is obstruction something obstructing to the blood flow that is obstructive here nothing obstruct right here the ventricular contraction and relaxation is, is not happen properly because of deposition of amyloid fibril or a bad protein in the myocardium or in the muscle of the heart especially the ventricle right and that is why it is not pumping well and not pumping well if your heart is pumping well you get a normal qrs if heart is pumping very low you have a narrow complex qrs this is qrs this is p this is q this is r this is s this is t so this qrs complex is normal but heart is not pumping well it has it does not have the force to pump right because of the limited dilatation limited relaxation right and that is why the volume is low low voltage qrs complex her vital signs are reasonably stable her lab values are okay which of the following could be helpful in establishing the diagnosis right so patient is a classical case of amyloidosis history all the features are mentioning so what do you think by doing what would be the base test we tell oh this is looks like a uh, uh, amyloidosis this is because of amyloidosis that is echocardiogram enzyme as you told troponin t troponin i and ckmb especially in acute coronary syndrome it is not acute coronary syndrome right because there is no history of hypertension no diabetes absolutely clear cut history of amyloidosis in acute mi there is usually no low voltage qrs rather qrs is going up st segment elevation right that is tami right so there is no troponin mention no i mention why not acute coronary because they need to mention here mi if it is mi there is st segment elevation or fresh lbbb these are the two only differential i mean these are the two diagnostic point for acute mi in fresh changes if somebody has a fresh st elevation m elevation in more than two leads it's mi acute or new development of lab bundle branch block it's mi that's it these are the two as per the book right so nothing mentioned that is why it's not acute coronary syndrome right so cardiac enzymes are gone ct scan abdomen will not help anything to know the chest things uh, recheck the potassium potassium we are not thinking of any hyperkalemia or cardiac arrest or a tall t wave right what we used to see in a, uh, this uh, hyperkalemia you must know right pic t wave or tall t wave in hyperkalemia x ray will not help so echocardiogram is the answer any question asil any question uh, sir why not why not uh, chest x ray sir like chest x ray will not going to tell you about the ejection fraction okay sir yes this is a restrictive cardiomyopathy patient has all the symptoms of restrictive cardiomyopathy right chest x ray at most if it is a bad uh, dilatation then this will chest x ray at most say oh this is dilated cardiomyopathy that's it or cardiomyopathy or little enlarged heart right that you can see the heart shadow from the chest x ray isn't it but the more confirmatory test right more the better test is a echocardiogram because it will give you completely idea about the heart heart wall heart thickness ejection fraction pulmonary artery pressure everything and it rules out the other conditions as well so comparatively x ray versus echo echo is better than x ray is that clear is that clear yes or no yes sir yes sir fine yes, so 
Wonderful. So this is the explanation. This woman has a restrictive cardiomyopathy. This condition is often brought by infiltrating diseases such as amyloidosis, sarcoidosis and carcinoid syndrome may lead to extensive cardiac damage. Due to increased myocardial stiffness, the ventricular filling is impaired, leading to a manifestation of the right heart failure. So these all symptoms are of a right heart failure. To identify this condition, it is helpful to obtain an echocardiogram to distinguish it from the other possible causes and cardiac catheterization could also be done. Is that clear? This is the low voltage ECG. I got the picture from internet. So just to make sure that you understand and you know what feel of low cardiac voltage. That is why I took this picture from Google. Right. So this is the picture. So this is you can see here. This is low voltage. Ideally, it should be like this P Q R S T. Right. But it is very low voltage. A low voltage is not only just seen in seven numbers that is infiltrative or restrictive like amyloidosis. Along with that, there are few conditions which you generally keep in your mind. And what is the definition of low voltage? Low voltage is peak to peak QRS. Peak, this peak to peak QRS M is less than 5 millimeter. Uh, right? Uh, is called as a low voltage. It should be more than 5 normally in normal ECG. So not only the amyloidosis, you get low voltage ECG, but you get in obesity. You get in COPD, you get in a pericardial effusion, you get in severe hypothyroidism, subcutaneous uh, emphysema and massive myocardial damage or infarction in that case. So again, MI, it's possible you get this, right? But along with that, you also get the troponin T, troponin I, classical history and comorbidity. So that's it. What I conclude this uh, for the low voltage is ECG just to get you better idea and understanding what is low voltage. Is that clear, Dr. Azil, to you now? Yes, sir. I'm clear with it, sir. Wonderful. Brilliant. Thank you, sir. Two questions we discuss. Write down your score. What is your score and what is my score? Third question in front of your screen. The 17-year-old boy is brought to the emergency department by paramedic. He was found unconscious after a motor vehicle accident. Upon presentation, the patient is noted to have multiple mandibular and maxillary fracture as well as open right-sided tibia fibula fracture. The patient remains unconscious with an oxygen saturation of 78% on 2 liter oxygen via face mask with pulse of 146 per minute. Blood pressure is 60 over 20. Which of the following is the first step in the management? Administer the IV fluid, continue with the face mask ventilation and proceed with the rest of the primary trauma survey. See Proceed with the cricothyrotomy, proceed with the nasopharyngeal intubation and proceed with the oropharyngeal intubations. Very interesting questions. I want one volunteer to discuss this. Sir, Puneet sir, welcome. How are you, sir? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, for uh, having me here. Work. And Hopefully, you are not boring with uh, this, uh, everything. No, 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 sir. Just because we just said, okay, if you just come to, you can just also meet the group. So I just said, I'll just log in for some time. Actually, I'm out, but uh, just fight. No I just said, I'll just join in. No and, problem. Uh, very nice explanation, sir. Thank I'm also seeing. And I think uh, the group will also enjoy uh, my, uh, we'll be starting with the Gainak session soon. Sure, uh, sir. So, uh, sure, sir. Our pleasure, sir. Yeah. Our pleasure, sir. Yes. Our pleasure. So it is uh, nice. It will be great to teach uh, students outside India. Thank you very uh, much. And uh, it will be a nice uh, session. It will be a nice session. Much. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Sir. And thank the students you, are going to enjoy the lecture. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, yes, sir, please. Thank please you, sir. Continue. Thank you, sir. I've uh, seen just now. Sorry, huh? I just missed. I was absolutely. No, no problem, sir. Just five minutes. No problem, sir. No thank problem. You, sir. Thank uh, you. Uh, we are teaching in the MCQ is more important. You cannot break the flow in between. So, thank no you, problem, sir. I'll just the students that will be uh, you, available on the platform uh, thank to you, help them to the gynec experiment. Thank you, very much. Thank you, sir. Thank sure. you, sir. Yeah, Dr. Thank Puneet thank is a consultant gynecologist senior and he's on various platform of NEET, NEET PG. And PG student is also excellent, brilliant coach. So he probably give us his expertise in next couple of weeks. Let's see. So this third question's answers. Uh, good morning, sir. Mm. Good sir, morning. Uh, Who is this? I sorry, I mean. Prefer, uh, to do your an name? emergency. Your name. Your name. Sorry, sorry, first. sorry. Your name, doctor. Sorry. Sir, this is my Mithila, sir. Mithila. Oh, sorry. Huh? Yeah, tell me. What Sir, do you I want would, to do? I would prefer to first put 
hydrotomy because airway has to be established first before breathing and circulation. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to give the IV fluid first because blood pressure is 60 over 20. So you don't think it's very, very bad blood pressure to this patient. Mm, yes, sir. 60 over 20 blood pressure. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is important. So what, what I mean, just uh, you mm. don't go with my answer. I'm just trying to understand. <laughs> You keep you stick to your answer, and this is my just logic. This is mm. 60 over 20, oxygen is low, so you cannot give oxygen or you cannot take care of airway first or then circulation. What do you think? What do you do for this patient? For uh, okay, I, I would change my answer to mm -hmm. um, you can you can think over it, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dr. Ruchita, any comment from you, Dr. Ruchita? Mm, sir, no, sir. I am learning and I no, want no, to no. just... I am also through, learning. <laughs> I am also learning. <laughs> <laughs> I am also learning. But you, you are going for exam or just not going for any exam? Yes, no, no, sir. I am going. Which exam you are going but, for? Uh, OMSP and KMLE. Wonderful. So if the same question will come, what will you do? Uh, you have to answer something. Wonderful. That's fine. Wonderful. We'll discuss definitely. But at yes, least post yes. one answer, right or wrong. Exam yes, are not there is no negative marking. So if you make a wrong, you won't have a negative impact on your result. You understand? Yes. So you sir. must have yes, to answer sir. something. Forget about right or wrong, but you can't make it black. Yes. Yes, Dr. Okay. Sahir. Any comment, Dr. Sahir? Sorry? Any comment? Sir, you are telling me, Dr. Tarik? Yeah, yeah. Any comments, sir? Hi, yes, sir. sir I would Hi, like... yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, one Can by one, no problem. Me? We are not in hurry. We want to understand the things. Because if we understand one question, we may answer 10 questions in exam. Dr. Fayaz Ahmad, would you like to comment, sir, on this? Dr. Fayaz, sir? Dr. Nemisha? Dr. Nemisha? Any volunteer? Any volunteer? Uh, uh, emergency yes, physician, uh, those who are working in emergency, this is day-to-day -day job. Yes, it's nothing a uh, new question. Uh, some young boy presented with facial maxillary injury. Go with the airway first. We yes, have to follow uh, the airway first. Okay, so so everyone is uh, airway. Okay, fine. So what's the answer basically? Everything can, everything can manage airway, na? Crico can do nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal. We can't, we can't go for the nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal. Just tell me your name, so at least I can understand. Doctor Sahir. Doctor. Sorry, doctor. Sir, Dr. Vidya. Yeah, Dr. Vidya. Yes, tell me. Now we will close this answer with your explanation. What do you think? What's the answer? Uh, as the patient is maintaining, maintaining a saturation of a 78 percentage, mm -hmm. uh, he is having a, he is in hypovolemic shock with a okay. pulse rate of 146 and BP is also low. Right. So we can start by administering fluids followed by the rest of the management because he's already on a face mask ventilation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do you think? Managing airway will life threatening or not managing the circulation will life threatening? What they are saying, this is little tricky questions. I mean, practically we treat in a different way, but as for the exam point of view, I'm discussing first, which of the following is the first step in the management? So what will you do the first when this patient comes to your emergency room? In emergency, what uh, you protocol? The, ABC yeah. or what? How you manage? CABC, CABC, patient is unconscious and without pulse, then we go for the CABC. Yeah. If pulse is there, then go for the ABC. Yeah, so basically ABC we will do, right? Airway, breathing and circulation, right? So all three important, see, nothing is, you cannot avoid anything out of this three because this is emergency. So airway, maintaining the airway is most important thing in this patient, right? Now see, the again, go retrospectively. 
the unconscious he found unconscious so he is not conscious road traffic accident multiple mandibular and maxillary so he's a very bad facial injuries and multiple things and he has a tibial fracture so probably this tibia maxillary and mandibular fracture does not cause the hypotension why because there is no major blood loss but the tibia right femur is something right where you get a major blood loss and possibly because of that hypotension and hypovolumia patient may be syncope unconscious tachycardia so it's a classical case of probably the hypovolumic shock with unconscious so probably you may have brain injury as well we don't know right because we did not evaluate this patient by ct brain brain plane blah blah just to rule out the ich intracranial right but you go by the abc right so absolutely this is important i'm not saying that this is not important but beyond the airway iv fluid right it takes some time but the, the absolutely most important critical thing is to secure and maintain the airway toward first you have to secure the airway and you need to maintain that airway right once you secure but it is blocked it doesn't mean right so you need to do proper suction and proper maintenance of the airway as well so secure and maintain this is the two word so you need to do the airway maintain so by which way you can do it continue with the face mask ventilation proceed with the rest of the primary so continue face mask will not going to face mask is just the outside right trachea is inside so you need to secure something inside right proceed with the cricothyrotomy proceed with the nasopharyngeal is absolutely difficult nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal these are not good to you right especially in a facial injury or facio maxillary injury so best closest answer would be go for cricothyrotomy right absolutely this is cricothyrotomy right along with the airway and breathing again definitely you need to give by default uh, iv fluid and if iv fluid not responding you may go to noradrenaline or inotrop support as well just to elevate the blood pressure but the primary thing otherwise patient will die because of the uh, this things right so at least with the hypotension probably he will not die because of hypovolemia he has a low blood pressure right he may go in organ failure he may go in the brain damage he may he will not die but if you don't secure the airway he will die right probably aspiration cricothyrotomy is indicated in a patient who cannot be intubated or who has suffi uh, or who has a, a sustained significant facio maxillary injury or trauma such as in this patient who has a multiple maxillary and facial uh, these things this is the basic anatomy which you need to know understand right so three things you need to think this is the hyoid bone right just below it the hyoid bone there is a cartilage called thyroid cartilage and below thyroid cartilage uh, this is called as a cricoid cartilage right so here you and this is the thyroid gland here is situated is the thyroid gland so cricothyrotomy so what you can do you can do the directly puncture here and immediately within a one second you can secure the airway right because up part is all damaged right facio maxillary part facial part you cannot do nasotracheal or nasopharyngeal oropharyngeal blah blah it's all damaged rather you are going to do more damage or bleeding already or aspiration so this is the best way in emergency to do the cricothyrotomy right tracheostomy is even more secure and more perfect than cricothyrotomy but tracheostomy again invasive again you need to enter through this uh, tracheostomy means you have to enter to the trachea right so tracheostomy needs little more expertise to enter into the trachea while this can be done even with the uh, some resident as well and it's a life saving so this is the things this is exactly the comparison i also given you probably you must be knowing especially the emergency guy and i intensivist but i try to make it little more clarity on this what is cricothyro what is tracheostomy cricothyrotomy used in emergency this is also used in emergency but it is more time consuming preparing the tracheostomy and all uh, this is temporary airway access so in emergency it is absolutely the best this is long term a patient is in the icu right and you want to give probably you don't know brain damage or brain dead they may be for weeks and years and months then you need to do tracheostomy crico will not uh, last long uh, here the fiber optic view is not required because you are just directly doing the puncture just above the uh, this uh, suprasternal loach while this is recommended because you may end up with entering the tube either in right bronchus or left bronchus or esophagus so you need some kind of uh, this fiber optic for tracheostomy local anesthesia is, is probably not required you directly puncture here you required 
right analgesia and little sedation because they will not allow you to do usually done in adult right and this is done in children why it is not done in children why only adult because there is a risk of development of car, uh, cartilage defect right in a young children if you do it there is a under development of cartilage because of trauma or injury so usually done in adult this can be done in adult and children less bleeding and complication here need more expertise ideal in obese patient huge thyroid and innominate arteries right ideal right here it's difficult right in sometimes this obese patient very very obese patient difficult to do tracheostomy as well right and uh, speedy and simple here you need icu hospitalization or little more expertise so this is what the basic uh, little differentiation between this versus this just for your better clarity and understanding i put it this slide so you can understand better yes midila now your turn midila any comment yes sir no sir no sir understood is that clear yes sir anyone so i got confused when you again re, uh, repeated the question that whether circulation should be given the first priority my job is to confuse you yes sir. you need to form on your answer so you that need to made, form your, that your answer let's think again i can tell you 1 plus 1 is 5 but you show no no sir 1 plus 1 is 2 whatever you tell 1 plus 1 is 2 you understand correct sir. right so this is learning platform this is learning but hopefully you will not forget now and definitely i won't forget thank you right. so much sir no worries let's jump to the fourth questions check your score don't forget your score out of 3 how much is right how much is your wrong post me the answer later on to my personal don't take it otherwise just for understanding a full term 6 days old boy present to a physician office for routine care he is tolerating breast milk well he is urinating defecating sleeping normally physical examination reveals an alert newborn with mild eczema good skin turgor normal reflex and musty odor his newborn laboratory screening is notable for phenyl ketone in the urine which is the best advice to give his parents regarding the body boy's diet are you going to tell them okay increase the iron so that helps this patients or niacin or phenylalanine or increase tyrosine or increase vitamin d what helps this patient diet boys post your answer take 30 seconds not a in hurry yes monica dr monica any comment Sir, I don't want to post it. I, I want to post it at C. Increase phenyl and indeed. Okay, so you are Dr. Monica, right? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Thank uh, you no. for your participation. One minute. Let me finish with Dr. Monica. So, what's your diagnosis, Dr. Monica? What is the sir, diagnosis in the, this patient? From phenyl ketonuria. Okay, so diagnosis is phenyl ketonuria. Wonderful. Our triad, I'm just trying to check my triad. What is the yes. investigation or how you confirm the diagnosis of phenylketonuria? The if I phenyl say phenylketonuria in urine plus musty odor, suggestive of it. Okay, great. Musty so, so, so by this musty odor and phenylketon in the urine, you can confirm the diagnosis. Okay, if the yes. phenylketonuria confirm the diagnosis, how you treat this patient? What's um, the treatment of the phenylketonuria? Phenylketonuria uh, increase. Um, Iron, things are increased iron. No, what is the treatment? So if I tell you, one, I'll give you in your final exam, right? That, okay, doctor, this is a case of phenylketonuria. Please tell me the treatment of phenylketonuria. So what's the treatment? That's it, simple question. Uh, sure, sir, no problem, think. no problem. That's fine. I'm absolutely happy. At least you are interacting with me. I'm more than happy. So your homework today is to go and read the phenylketonuria. Is that clear? Okay, sir. Okay. All right. Question will definitely come. People are avoiding this penile ketone urea and every time there are two questions in exam. Yes. Right. So don't ignore it. Yes. Any volunteer? Any volunteer? Yes. Yes, sir. So yes. this uh, diagnosis is penile ketone urea. Sorry. I'll just tell your Mithila. name. Sir, uh, Mithila, sir. Yeah. Sorry. Because I have 30, so, 40 people. I will just. Yeah. Yes, so, Mithila. sir, in penile ketone urea, the main defect lies in the conversion of phenylalanine to tyrosine. So, by increasing phenylalanine, we are making the condition worse. Uh, so, phenylalanine, the diets contain 
containing phenylalanine should be reduced and you should give tyrosine containing diet excellent wonderful so that's the answer increase tyrosine right because tyrosine is not there in the because at the stage of phenylalanine it, it stop right because it not yes. allow the conversion of phenylalanine to tyrosine and Good. excessive phenylalanine is accumulated in the body and that is a culprit for all manifestation isn't it yes sir wonderful okay what's the treatment midila you diagnose you this patient and give tyrosine containing food so that the metabolism that, that's is the only fat. treatment or any other medicine you want to give some drug which can uh, i mean reverse the pathophysiology of these things something like uh -huh. that any pharmacological agent help this patient no sir there is nothing mm. available phenyl ketonuria nothing available no i'm not okay. sure fair enough no no that's <laughs> fine because you never thought of such question and i'm asking that questions only <laughs> no because we just mug up and we forget the things yeah so that's fine no problem so let's see now what's the content of these things and what's the answer and how the flow the child has a phenyl ketonuria the pku phenyl alanine cannot convert it to tyrosine as midil absolutely told it is screened for at birth it's screened for every children at birth and it's detected by phenyl ketone in the urine as doctor told uh, classical feature of phenyl ketonuria are fair skin fair skin right so don't be happy if some baby is fair at the birth it could be phenyl ketonuria eczema musty odor uh, body odor mental retardation and mental retardation can be prevented by reducing the phenylalanine right right and increase the tyrosine kinase in the diet phenyl ketonuria is commonly known as a phenylalanine hydroxylase blah blah deficiency most common inborn error of amino acid metabolism and elevated phenylalanine level negatively impact the cognitive functions right so that should be keep in mind pharmacological treatment is also there so homework homework is to find out what drug can have important or what drug can prevent this mental retardation or can help the baby of phenyl ketonuria next question in front of your screen now so far four questions check your score how much right or wrong i don't need to know you check yourself 56 years old woman is brought to the emergency department by her spouse early evaluation of obtuneation earlier i will tell you many people doesn't know what is the meaning of these things obtuneation earlier in the evening right so what is the question 56 years old woman brought to the er emergency room or department by her spouse for the evaluation of this obtuneation earlier in the evening the spouse says that the patient complain of shakiness racing heartbeat patient has type 2 diabetes on sulfonylurea begins aspirin at the time of diabetes diagnosis there is a family history of heart disease on examination patient is oriented to person only appears lethargic diaphoretic her temperature is normal 98 blood pressure is 155 over 91 pulse rate is 112 respiratory rate is 18 laboratory suggest uh, studies are pending which of the following is the most likely to be used in the management of this patient now the meaning yellow yellow i marked yellow obtuneation means what it is a state similar to lethargy in which the patient has lessened interest in the environment slowed response to stimulation and tend to sleep more than a normal with drowsiness in between sleep states so this is general definition just for your understanding obtuneation means what it is a lethargy state right he has a less interest in self and surrounding or atmosphere and he has a more sleepiness so this is the one line of this all three line is obtuneation right so this is the patient in front of you right now what will you do right so let me go to the option you have four five things epinephrine administration insulin administration naloxone administration normalization of glucose level and tissue plasminogen activator administration right so it's a big question so i cannot uh, i mean accommodate in one slide so i make a two slide one is a question slide right this is the question and this is the option now your answer if you need some help tell me i will scroll right left just to get you the idea so can you uh, please change to the question slide again sir please? yes please no worries 
This is question Thank nine. Recently, some of the doctor two days back was talking to me. Long, long questions are now coming. I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm just trying to make you understand. You do the practice of few MCQs like this only. You never expect that one liner will come in exam. One liner will never come in exam. You need to understand scenarios. Sir, the answer slide, please, sir. Thank yes, please. No worries. Yeah, it's a little long question. I need the logic rather than answer. I'm always interested in logic than just giving A, B, C, D. Yeah, that, that, that you need to do definitely. But you need to know now, why you selected this answer. Because the uh, sulfur urinase drugs... Uh... Cause hypoglycemia. Okay. Okay. So, what's your so, answer? So, uh, answer is the normalization of the glucose level because of what? the diaphoretic lethargic presence. Excellent. Excellent. Super excellent. Super excellent. So, this is classical case. I mean, it's a scenario is long, but answer is easy. See, here what they are saying, right? What 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 they are telling whole the story is that, right? This patient is a fifty six years woman. All right this is this all this is all this obturation is what like patient has a lethargy patient has a this evaluation of this so this is like hypoglycemic symptoms he is a known case of diabetic patient is already on the sulfonylurea he is probably taking prophylactic aspirin as well otherwise patient is fine and now what is the current thing patient is oriented at person he doesn't know the time place and person so time not oriented place, not oriented only person. Appears lethargy. Appears diaphoretic means probably he is a tachycardia, right? And lab studies are pending. So what you can do in emergency? Either there is a one you need to keep in mind is OB, ABC, another is oxygen and third is a sugar. This is my definition in treating the patient in emergency. So whenever I called in emergency room, I look at these th three things. I'll see ABC, what is the ABC of the patient? Everything is fine. Okay, saturation fine, sugar fine, no need to worry, right? But the classical non-diabetic, non-sulfonylurea patient is developing with the hypoglycemic symptoms. Whatever the reports comes, you can just start and check the blood glucose or you can normalize the blood glucose. This patient has a hypoglycemia. So normalization of the blood pressure, right? Epinephrine is not needed. Why? Because this is not a patient with hypovolemic shock or anaphylactic shock. Insulin administration will worsen the condition because it is already low glucose and you are giving insulin, making more. Naloxone is antidote of what? Anyone quickly? Naloxone. Naloxone is antidote of what? Opium. Huh? Opioid. 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 You are all brilliant, brilliant people. Opioid. Right? Opioid or morphine, right? Where you give the naloxone, glucose, and this is a, a TPA. We are not expecting any acute coronary syndrome or stroke or something obstructed in the vessel. So, we are not expecting this. So, answer is a glucose. That's it. Is that clear? So, scenario was long. But if you try to correlate the history, the try to correlate the symptoms and everything, that, that probably now it's matched, right? When you are reading alone, it's little looks difficult. So, you need to, every, every details in the scenario is important. Believe me. And that's the clue for answer. So if you cultivate the art of reading the MCQ, then your 90% job is done. So here is the patient is in hypoglycemia and you have to treat that hypoglycemia. Next question. 55-year-old man with diabetes, hypertension, history of pneumonia, treated as an outpatient 20 years earlier, present now to the clinic during early follow-up blood pressure check. He currently works as a respiratory therapist at a local hospital and physician suggests that he receive a pneumococcus vaccine. What is the primary indication of receiving the vaccine? Because of his age, right? He has to receive, right? He's 55 years. So because of his age, you want to give the pneumococcal. He has a history of diabetes, right? That is why you want to give uh, this pneumococcal. He's a healthcare worker. Why? Because he's a respiratory therapist. In many people contact, patients contact. He has a hypertension. So if you want to hypertension and he has a past history of pneumonia 20 years back. So what indication you would suggest? What is the primary indication 
for receiving or giving the pneumococcal vaccine to this 55 years of old gentleman, whether it is age, diabetes, healthcare worker himself, hypertension, pneumonia. Simple but important. Yes. Yes, as you. Yes, as you. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir, a pneumococcal is indicated in 65 plus uh, people, sir. Uh -huh. And pneumonia was a very old history. It is like 20 years back. So that is also eliminated. Uh, diabetes and hypertension do not require a pneumococcal va vaccine. So the left out option is healthcare worker. So it is because of left out that you selected or you read somewhere? Uh, no, sir. I, I did not read it, sir. I only read that it's Indicated in 65 plus. Okay. And what is the major risk factor amongst these things? Having something what? Which makes more prone to develop bad pneumonia out of age, diabetes, healthcare worker, hypertension, pneumonia. What do you think? In general, I mean, it's an important question. Na? It's a very important question. Yes. So on what ground you, you can say that, no, no, this patient deserves the vaccination. Tell me. So being immunocompromised and being a healthcare worker with history of pneumonia altogether makes him so so, a high so risk healthcare risk. worker is more risky or diabetes or immunocompromised is a more risky. Sir, a diabetes or immunocompromised okay. more riskier. Yes, sir. Okay, so what what is a immunocompromised among A, B, C, D, and E? What hampers having what disease you so, you impair diabetes. the immunity? Diabetes. 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 So that is the answer. Diabetes is the answer. Right? Yes, sir. Is that clear? Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Diabetes is an indication for vaccine given that diabetic patients are considered to be immunocompromised. Diabetic, especially poorly controlled diabetic patients are vulnerable to infection. The chronic hyperglycemia of diabetes leads to abnormality in cell-mediated immunity and phagocytosis functions. Also, the vascular impairment of the disease prevent the immune system from responding appropriately to the infectious challenge. So, age is important, as you told, age and 65, but amongst the whole list, diabetes is on the top. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So we so far discussed six questions. Check your score. I don't need less than 50% of score. Those who have 50% less than how to increase, contact me. Seven question. You are called by a laboratory which reports gram positive cocaine cluster growing from the blood culture bottle. What is the best next step in the management? Start oxalicylin, start erythromycin, start vancomycin, start doxocycline. Consult infectious disease specialist. Wait for a speciation and specific culture and sensitivity report. And then you can decide, right? So wait for culture sensitivity report. And you just feel that, oh, it's contamination. Don't worry. No need to do anything. No treatment. It's fine. Take your 30 seconds. A small, not major scenario. Simple two-liner question, right? You have a laboratory. Report which shows gram positive cocci in cluster growing from the blood culture. So basically, blood culture grows gram positive cocci. What's treatment? That's it. That is what they asked. Dr. Namith, any comment from your side? If you have such patient, Dr. Namitha, how you manage? in your hospital. Any comment? Any comment? Any volunteer? Only one volunteer. No one out of 35, 40, no volunteer. Yes, Dr. Saima. 
Let me ask by name then. Yes, Dr. Saima Malik. Am I audible to you? Uh, yes, sir. Actually, sir, it's a gram positive cocci, uh, and uh, we have to give the antibiotic. It's not a resistant case, uh, so we cannot uh, uh, start vancomycin. And we have to choose. I have to choose between the A and B. And oxycillin is, I think, the best suitable uh, in my case uh, for the gram positive cocci. Okay. Maybe I'm just, wrong. No, that's yeah. fine. I mean, I'm happy when somebody interact. I'm happy. Forget about right or wrong. The logic yes. behind not selecting the vancomycin is what I could not understand. Why not vancomycin? So, uh, methyl resistant cases in methyl resistant cases we give them a vancomycin because sir, I'm not a, a doctor for the uh, emergency and for the infection. So that is why I have little knowledge regarding it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. No problem. No problem. Just I'm trying to understand. It's a learning platform. Okay. Does anyone else? Any comment? One more comment? From any allergy infection or anything, sir? Sorry, sir? No, any rise in temperature. No symptoms related to acute infection. Hmm. So what do you want to do for this patient? What will you select from A to G? It might be due to contamination or it may, we can wait for the culture sensitivity. And we can wait and observe the patient for future conditions. Symptoms. Fine. Fine. So, so what's your answer? In exam, if this question comes, what do you select? A, B, C, D, F, G? Option F, sir. What? F, F. Which option? F, F. Wait for the specification and sensitivity of the organism. Mm -hmm. Wait for. So, do you know at what time this uh, culture sensitivity reports comes? Sir? Do you know? Do you have any idea? When you ask for the anti... Sorry, sir? It will take more than a week, sir. More than a week. So, do you think it's a good idea those patients who have blood culture positive for gram positive cocci giving nothing? Don't you think so that this patient may go in a septicemia or DIC or he will die in a one week of period when the blood culture is positive? Sir, blood culture is positive, sir, but there is no any other positive findings of acute infection. So, so it's not all mandatory. It's not mandatory that they have immediately when patient develop within a one day, like a febrile neutropenia patient, say for example, okay. right? When they develop the blood culture positive, they many a time they are not very look sick, right? Okay. okay. Don't do in 24 hours, they will absolutely become a sick. Okay, okay. It's it's just not mandatory for your knowledge. It's not mandatory. Every chest pain, every acute MI does not have chest pain. Na? Have you okay. heard of silent MI? Have you heard of silent MI? Silent yes, MI, diabetic patient develops silent MI. They don't have chest pain. Why? Because the diabetes okay. is so badly controlled. All the nerves gas, or there is a neuropathy of now supplying the heart. So yes, you sir, don't yes, feel sir. any pain. To feel the pain, you now should working well. Right? In diabetes, yes, very neuropathy. So you don't feel any sensation. Why? Because nerves are damaged. B12, nerves are damaged. Right? Amyloidosis, myeloma, okay. nerves are damaged. You don't feel pain. Like that. So, it's not always that patient has a hypotension, patient has tachycardia, patient has high fever, then and then he's a critical. Okay. Right? So, okay. so, you should not ignore any blood culture positive. Right? At least give antibiotic. Once the blood report shows that, oh, culture is negative, then you can de-escalate or escalate the drug dose. Right? Okay. You, yeah. So, never ever, never ever wait and watch for any patient who has a blood culture positive. Okay. This is absolutely a learning point in ICU and emergency. These are the various pictures. You can see it later on. So the best empiric treatment for the gram positive cocci growing from the blood culture is a vancomycin. If there is no intolerant or allergic to vancomycin, the correct answer. If some patient has a vancomycin allergy, then second option is linezolin, daptomycin, and septralonin is a fourth or fifth, fifth generation, I guess, cephalosporin, septarolin. Right, so these are the drug of choice for gram positive cocci and MRSA, doctor. MRSA, you're talking about MRSA, right? Methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus, that is a gram positive cocci, MRSA. So until proved otherwise, blood culture positive, until and unless the blood culture report comes, go and give the vancomycin. That's it, write down in your notes. It's an international guideline. Is that clear? So, based empiric therapy. Empiric therapy means what? You don't know the organism. 
but you need to give why because blood culture is positive and microbiology is saying that there is a gram positive cocci so it is until proved otherwise it's a staphylococcus methicillin resistant staphylococcus so considered until proved otherwise to mrsa considered and give the vancomycin if the vancomycin patient is allergic or intolerant then you can have a second option is linezolid daptomycin and septarolin right again oxacillin is why not oxacillin is not covering mrsa for your knowledge so you told oxalicillin but oxalicillin does not cover the mrsa go and read the antibiotic chapter in mtb the first lecture anyway so that's it so this is what the answer is so so far this is the all story i will share it with you i want to finish more two three questions then switch over to dr sikha so seven questions so far check your score later on how much this is the correct answer and what's your score next last two questions a 43 year old woman is brought to the emergency department after being burnt in a house fire you establish you you uh, measured the area of burns your first right your estimate is first degree burns is 20 percent of your body second degree burns is 11 percent of your body third degree burns is nine percent of her body and she weighs around 60 kg height is 167 centimeter tall what IV therapy would you begin immediately to this patient? RL 200 ml per hour, 24 hours, normal saline 400 for 24 hours, normal saline 150 for 8 hours, followed by 75 next 16 hours, ringer lactyl 300 for 8 hours, and then next 16 hours is 150 cc per hour, and same the first 8 hours 600 ml per hour, and then rest 16 hours 300 ml. Very simple questions, but you need to know the Parkland formula. If you know the Parkland formula for buns, this question you can crack it in a one minute. Just you need to apply the calculator. That's it. Dr. Umer Anwar, any comment, Dr. Umer? Yes, sir. Any comment? You you selected, uh, I can see all the answers. So you selected, I think, answer E, ringer lactic 600 for 8 and then 300. If I'm not wrong, am I right or wrong? Yes, sir. Answer yeah, so e. what's the, yeah, so what's the logic? How did you brought this? Just trying to understand. Sir, I read it somewhere in the notes that we need to administer ringer lactic 600 per no, no, CC no, per hour. No, 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 stop you and bother you there is a without right. calculator you cannot give any iv period to any patient so uh, 600 is not fixed sir there is a calculator i'll i'll share yeah. you in one minute i'm just trying to okay. understand don't take it otherwise so I, My I purpose, know the rule of nine no rule of nine applies for how much area of the burns is involved that is area uh, by rule of nine right, right. so rule of right. nine is different and parkland formula is meant only for resuscitation by IV fluid to the burns patient in first 24 hours. So, this both are things different. So, whenever any burns patient comes, two jobs you have to do. How much is the area of burns? 20%, 30%, 40%. That can be calculated by the rule of nine. Once you made that, okay, 50% burns, then next question is how much fluid you will give in 24 hours to the 50% of burns. Is that clear or not? Yes, sir. So then we need to uh, add on the twenty percent, eleven percent, and nine percent burns, right? So you 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 decide and you tell me. I mean, I'm just 20, trying to understand. Okay. Right, you sir, calculate 20, by your own. 20, you calculate 40. and tell. Get back to me. You calculate. Just a minute, sir. Yeah, yeah. You take your own time. We are not at all in hurry. You calculate this. I'm just trying to understand what formula. Hello, and can, yes. Sir, can I ask, sir? Yes, please. Hello. Yeah. Uh, so, Parkland formula calculated by 4 multiplied by body weight by burn percentage. So, uh, first uh, degree percentage is not uh, included. So, you can you add 11 and 9 percent that comes to 20 percent. So, 20 multiplied by 60 and 4 is come to 4,800. Uh, 4, okay. So, 4,800 into 24 hours. So, first half of the volume is given in uh, 8 hours. So, you divide uh, 4,800 into Two that comes 2,400. So, first uh, eight hours you give uh, uh, 2,400 divided by eight. That comes to 300. Wonderful. So, so answer is D. The answer is D. First eight hours you give 300. 
the next is you given uh, perfect in our you give half it absolutely uh, clear cut absolutely yeah. clear cut so this is the parkland formula this is parkland formula i will share this formula 4 ml right so 4 ml is fixed percentage of buns so percentage of buns here is the trick first degree buns is never calculated in buns part it's a superficial buns just for your knowledge that is why to confuse you i put that the first degree buns as well 20%. So don't count 20%. First degree burns is not calculated whether it is 10%, 0%, or 100%. Leave it. So second degree burns is 11%. Third degree burns is 9. So 11 plus is 9 is 20. Come to the formula. So 4 ml multiply by 20% multiply by weight in kg. So what is the weight in kg? It is given as a 60 kg. So get back to the formula is a 60 kg. So 4,800, you can calculate my maths is good, not bad, right? So this can be divided in two parts, 2,400 in first eight hours and remaining 2,400 in remaining 16 hours. So eight plus 16 is equal to first 24 hours. This is the fluid management. And eight divided by 24 is means 300 ml per hour followed by 150 cc ml per hour for next 18 hours. So this is the answer. So look for the answer option where it is written 300 ml per hour for 8 hours followed by 150. So this is the answer. So where is the answer? So this is the answer. Ringer rated 824 by 8 by 300 is 24 and 150 multiplied by 16 is 24. So this is the answer. Is that clear? Yes, Umair. Now your question. Yes, sir. I'm 100% clear. I think I will never make this mistake ever again. You are a brilliant man. This is how we have to understand. It's not mug up 800, 600, 10, 100. Understand? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Simple formula, sir. Simple formula. It was Just... really easy, actually. <laughs> that is why I'm here, no, brother. Yes, thank you so much. My concept is totally clear now. Wonderful. You are a brilliant man. Right. So this is what the thing is. So we don't need to mug up. We need to mug up this formula. That's it. 4 multiply by percentage of buns multiply by weight into kg. Half half divided 816. That's it. Job is done. It's not a rocket science MCQ. Right. Last but not the least. I'm finishing my time as well. Meanwhile, I'll wait for Dr. Sikha. If Pallav is there, call Sikha and get ready for the next session. Probably 2-5 minutes break. Uh, continuing will not uh, this disconnect the class will continue with the same switch over uh, this is the picture in your exam identify the grade of diabetic retinopathy i had given the clue av nipping right av nipping just to be a better concept clarity av nipping means at arteries and veins they are crossing each other that is called av nipping is it grade one grade two grade three grade four simple but important Hopefully, you enjoyed this. Dr. Sikha, are you there in the class? Sikha, no phone, Karina, ready, Kevin, Ken. Or punch me, no punch, sir. Anyone? Yes, Saima. Have you seen this picture ever? Dr. Saima? Azil? Uh, no, sir. This is the first time I'm com coming across this question. <laughs> yeah, yes, but sir. it's an important question. Na? Yes, sir. That is why I'm preparing you na, in advance. Doing Thank hard you for work, that. Doing yes, hard sir. work for that only. No? You cannot, I mean, feel googly while it, you see first time in exam. This is a very common question. And on one third of the world is suffering from diabetes. So this is the most important thing. <laughs> you understand? Right? So yes, sir. this is the answer. Anyway, nothing much. This is a grade of retinopathy. Right? So AV nipping, basically, atriovenous nipping, AV nipping. Right? So grade one arterial thickening and they are just be tortuous second grade is av nipping 
then third is a retinal ischemia cotton wool cotton wool grade 3 cotton wool right you can see this cotton wool and papilledema so this are so you have to remember four word if they mention silver wiring grade 1 av nipping grade 2 cotton wool grade 3 papilledema grade 4 that's it this is a very important interesting picture mcq in your exam and let me have a last questions before uh, the Sikha switch over to me. Patient. So you have nine questions. Check your answer. Don't disclose me. Check yourself. That's it. Patient had a history of pancreatic cancer on chemotherapy, then improved completely. Came to the doctors concerning about recurrence of the cancer and history of many hospital visits. This patient has malingering, hypochondriasis, factitious disease, conversation. Yes, Asan. Yes, any comment? Volunteer, any comment? Anyone? Just the last question. I have many questions. I can speak all the day, but Sikha is waiting, I guess, back to back. Uh, actually, this patient has a psychiatric issue, sir. Yes, sir. So he is visiting a lot of hospitals. Yes, sir. And he did not believe that he his disease has been cured. Okay. So what so what this, this condition is? Hypochondriasis. Okay. So do you think there's a lot of patients like this in Kerala? <laughs> there are a lot of in Gujarat. <laughs> Hello. Not hear you, sir. How many patients you see like this? Even you tell them that okay, you are cured, but still they keep coming and doing these things. Sometimes we I come across some 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 of the patients, but not that much. But sometimes yes. But you keep in mind because such type of patient across the globe hypochondriasis, right? So in scenario, what will they will do? So either pancreatic cancer, another common question, what I come across the past recalls of various exam, HIV patient coming repeatedly to the doctors, right? In spite of getting cured or HIV, HIV, ELISA is negative, still he is thinking I have HIV. This is a hypochondriasis. Patient has a gastric cancer, it's cured, but again and again, every three months, coming and doing the endoscopy, and all endoscopies are normal, hypochondriasis. Patient has pancreatic cancer, improved cure, scans normal, still he feels that he has a recurrence or disease, hypochondriasis. Is that clear? So patient's disease part, patient's pathology is gone, but patient feels, not the doctor, patient feels that still I have something wrong. That is in the mindset, hypochondriasis. How you treat hypochondriasis? If patient comes to you with hydro, hypochondriasis, how you treat this patient? Three things I told you. Na. Any questions, you can make a three questions. Three MCQ you can easily make. What is the diagnosis? How you investigate this hypochondriasis and what is the treatment of hypochondriasis? So in one question, three questions. What is the treatment of hypochondriasis? So this is homework for all people. Sorry? Cognitive to arrange behavior. Cognitive behavior therapy. Okay. If does not work, then what is the next treatment? You had given cognitive. That's fine. It's a correct answer. Absolutely correct answer. What's the drug name, drug, group, any? So homework for everyone. Everyone, we are 35, 40 people in group. Those who are listening to me, go and read hypochondriasis. Three things. What is hypochondriasis? How you diagnose hypochondriasis? How you investigate hypochondriasis? How you treat hypochondriasis? 100% this patient question will come. Either this, this or this. I don't want to make it wrong. Yes, Dr. Yes, Sikha, are you there? Yes, yes, sir. So, uh, what investigation you told about hydrochondriasis investigation? That is your homework, brother. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yes, sir, you treat with SSRIs. We'll discuss in the next lecture. My okay. lectures are endless lectures, so we'll discuss. But 
you do some hard work, na? I did the hard work for last one week to pre prepare this. So hopefully you will do some 10, 15 minutes hard work to just read about hypochondriasis. What do you think? Yes, sir, for sure. Why not? Definitely, I will get back to you on WhatsApp after reading this. Wonderful. So now it's time for little feedback very quickly from audience before uh, Sikha will join to us. Right. So any volunteers? Sikha, are you there? You are in the class? Wonderful. So just I'll introduce you one minute. I'm about to finish in one minute. Please. Thank you. Yes. So any feedback? Quick feedback. Quick feedback. Anything you learn first time, you listen first time, you make it feel it's interesting first time. I think everything was first time. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Excellent. Then you will enjoy me more. Excellent. Yes. Anyone? Audience? Thank you for the class, sir. It is very interesting. Very, nice. very informative, sir. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So now my job is done. The super duper another next uh, this uh, uh, speaker is Dr. Sikha. Let me introduce. She is with us sir. for quite yes. Yeah, yeah. Speak up. No problem. I also would like to say that your approach is really amazing. Thank you the very much. You, uh, uh, you don't demotivate any student if they don't know the answer. And I think that's really uh, a very uh, an amazing way of teaching. Thank you very much. I get motivated more for next Sunday. <laughs> thank you. So thank now you, let me thank you, Nada, for your uh, kind uh, this feedback. So now let me introduce Dr. Shikha Gar. She is a consultant gynecologist and obstetrician, quite well experienced, very well versed with all obstetric and gynec procedure, laparoscopy, and working in a reputed institute in India. Right. So she is delivering the regular lectures with us in our personal coaching, online coachings, or many various uh, platforms. So she is now more active and it's our pleasure and privilege to listen her, her expertise. And uh, honestly speaking, Gynec is one of the major areas in any exam of Middle East country. By my experience, it's around 25-30%, let me tell you. So one third of it is the Gynec. So let me welcome uh, to Dr. Sikha. Please switch over. I am also the audience now. I am not a coach now. I will absolutely listen whole Gynec. Not very good in gynec, but I will try to learn and understand. Thank you very much. Yes, Sikha. Sikha, are you there? Yes, you can uh, switch over, doctor. You have your PowerPoint or slide uh, or... Pallavi, are you there? One minute. Huh? So she's not audible enough. I think no, no. she had a message no, no. as well. No problem. One minute. I'm just a little switching from one system to another. Sir, for one minute, can you uh, give the next slide of this, Regina? I want to take a slide, um, screenshot of that picture. Next of this slide. I think sir is switching with Dr. Shika. Just wait for one minute. I'm coordinating for you guys. Just give me a two minutes, please.
एक मिनट चालू रख देता हूँ डॉक्टर शिखा आर यू देर डॉक्टर शिखा Yeah, you are audible. You can okay. share the screen now. I cannot okay. share now. I I am out from the share okay. screen. So you can share and you can start. I can share the screen. One moment. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, is the screen visible to everybody? Yes, yes, it's visible very well, ma'am. Absolutely okay. visible. All right, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for a beautiful introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope I'm audible to everyone. Hi, okay, sir. The phone chalu ra. Um, so just a thing. If, if I maximize this window, the screen sharing will continue. Yeah, Is yeah. It okay now. Yeah, yeah. We can see your screen, madam. You can write okay. from uh, upper side insert, and there is a ball pen and all. If you know on the left upper corner, file home and insert. So there is what I am writing. You can select the pen and color if you wish. Okay. Uh, no, sir, I won't be using that uh, right. No problem. You can go with your style. I'm just trying to explain. Okay. You okay. go with your flow. Don't worry. Yeah. The content is important, okay. not drawing. Yes. So you carry on. Okay. So I'll get started. Yes, please. Uh, so, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. So as uh, rightly said, uh, OBG does constitute a very important part in your exam. And uh, uh, the best thing about OBG, I mean, just to make the matters light, the best thing about OBG is that it's not very complicated or in fact, I should say not at all complicated. Only some concepts are there. And uh, for some concepts, you need to have a bit of knowledge. And for some concepts, you need to be able to think. That is all. So here, when I'm going to teach you, the main idea is that I'm able to explain you the concept so that even if we don't get the exact question in the exam, but even if you get anything around that concept, you will be able to guide your thinking. This is the feedback I have been getting from a lot of students who have been attending the classes. So we'll get started from the question. As like uh, Sir was doing, you can type your answers in the chat box itself. So I'll explain you the question and at the end of one minute, I'll tell you the answer. So we'll get started with the first one. A 38 year old, uh, see, whenever I'm reading a question, if they, uh, whenever you start a question in OBG, always, always focus on the age of the patient. And by default, I will always say patient. I will not say male or female because for us, by default, it is female patient only. So a 30, 38 year old, G4, P3, fourth gravida, para 3, at 33 weeks of gestation, presents for a routine OB visit and is not found to have a fundal height of 29 centimeter. Ultrasound is performed and demonstrates an estimated fetal weight in the fifth centile for the gestational age. The biopirital diameter and the abdominal circumference are concordant in size. Concordant means they are matching. So if a patient is 33 weeks by period of gestation, fundal height you are getting 29, that is 4 centimeter less. And ultrasound is showing a fetal weight in the fifth centile. Okay, from the expected range, it is coming in fifth centile, which is less. And bipyridal diameter and abdominal circumference are matching in the size. So, which of the following is associated with symmetric growth restriction? Um, as I can explain you from this question, it is a case of intrauterine growth restriction of the fetus. And when we say that when we do fetal estimated weight, we take four parameters on the ultrasound. That is bipyridal diameter, abdominal circumference, head circumference, and femur length. When all the four parameters or even two, they are matching, we call it, we call it concordant and we call it a symmetric IUGR. So, which is the com which is a cause of symmetric IUGR? Is it nutritional deficiency, chromosomal abnormalities, hypertension, or uteroplacental insufficiency? I'll be putting on the timer so that I think forty five should be enough for sir.
So, yeah, the answer here is chromosomal abnormalities. Now, a bit about the explanation. If you get a question on IUGR, how you're supposed to think about that question? The first thing is, um, the first thing is you should know about, uh, is there some noise coming in the background? Please keep everybody, uh, your audios mute. Yeah. So, about IUGR, you should be able to think about symmetric IUGR and asymmetric IUGR. What is the main differentiating point of the two kinds of IUGR? The differentiating point is abdominal circumference. First of all, the abdominal circumference is the only parameter which gets first affected whenever growth restriction starts. Okay. Why is it so? I have explained in my regular classes also. Why is it so? Is because the fetal abdomen contains liver. And when we take the measurement of abdominal circumference in ultrasound, 50% of the measurement comes from the fetal liver. So when growth restriction is there, and fetal doesn't fetus doesn't have enough number of nutrients. It starts consuming its own fetal, uh, liver glycogen. That is why the liver becomes smaller in size, and that small size gives a smaller abdominal circumference. Now all these things will happen when the blood supply to the fetus is compromised at certain level. Okay, it could happen because of mother's nutrition deficiency. It could be uterine placental insufficiency because of any reason or hypertension in mother causing insufficient blood supply to the fetus. This is called as asymmetric IUGR, okay? Only AC gets affected, that is abdominal circumference. The other things, BPD, HC, and femur length, that is the bone growth of the fetus, con continues to increase without getting affected. Now, the option of chromosomal abnormalities, this is one such place where the genetics of the fetus is involved and it is going to hamper all the four parameters of fetal growth equally. Okay. So, uh, um, the fet fetal growth abnormalities, that is less growth and excessive growth. We call it percentile of 5th and 95th percentile. Less than 5th percentile, it is called as IUGR. More than 95th percentile, it is called a big baby or a macrosomic baby. Also, for your exam point of view, if any time they ask uh, which is a big baby or macrosomic baby, more than 3.5 kg is considered as a big baby. Okay. So, here the answer is chromosomal abnormalities because the genetic potential of the fetus is affecting bone growth as well as the abdominal. It's, in this case, the liver glycogen is not getting depleted, but overall, the fetus itself is small. So, if I ask you the question, which will have a better prognosis, <clears throat> the asymmetric IUGR will always have a better prognosis because it's a temporary uh, restriction of fetal growth and the abdomen became compromised. But once such babies are born, they easily catch up the growth because the external supplementation is good. So, I hope I'm clear on this question. So, here that's why I have written symmetric IUGR versus asymmetric IUGR. The differentiating point is the uh, AC is affected and AC is only small, other three are normal. It is called as asymmetric IUGR. Let's go on to the next question. A primary gravida with full-term pregnancy in labor for one day. Okay, now labor for one day is brought to casualty after uh, its outside handling. On examination, she is dehydrated, slightly pale, pulse is 100 per minute, BP is normal. Abdominal examination reveals a fundal height of 36 weeks, which is normal. Cephalic presentation, heart rate is absent, fetal heart rate is absent, mild uterine contractions present. On PV examination, cervix is fully dilated, head is plus one station, caput with molding is present, pelvis is adequate, dirty infected discharge is present. What would be the best management option after the initial workup? Do you want to do a C-section? You want to give oxytocin drip? You want to give a ventus delivery? Or you want to do a craniotomy and vaginal delivery? So this is a case of IUD during labor. And uh, okay, you try to attempt the answer after that.
Okay, I hope you have attempted the answer by now. See here, this is a case of obstructed labor. Okay, so obstructed labor in modern day obstetrics, the management is very, very clear. Obstructed labor, uh, if the fetus is alive or dead, either of the two scenarios, it has to be done for the mother's sake. If it is fetus alive, then definitely for mother and fetal sake. If the fetus is dead, then for mother's sake. The management in modern obstetrics for obstructed labor is always, always cesarean delivery. Okay, cesarean delivery. In this question, let me try to explain you what are the clue points here that you should choose. Um, you should choose cesarean delivery, and which I will I'll explain you all the options one after the other. See what happens is patient is dehydrated and she is been in labor for one day. See the dictum in modern obstetrics for a patient is labor is that a laboring patient should not see any two sunsets or sunrises together. Okay, meaning to say patient should deliver, once she goes into active labor, she should deliver within 24 hours. That is the dictum in modern obstetrics. This is how we manage our patients. So, a patient who has been in labor for one full day and then she's brought to casualty, she's dehydrated because obstructed labor is, it is a mechanical obstruction to the passage of the fetus. So, the Vigorous uterine contractions, they are trying to push the baby out very hard. But because of some reason, see obstruction could be because of many, many reasons. Mechanical, because of the deformed pelvis or there could be some fibroid or something at the lower segment level or the fetal head is big. Okay, CPD, obvious CPD is there which was not diagnosed previously. Obstructed labor used to be very, very common in the era when the ultrasound was not there and we did not know the size of the baby. But nowadays, it's although a rare entity, but still the cases are still seen. So this is a topic uh, for some reason, even though of much of a historical interest, but for some reason, the examiners are very fond of asking questions on this topic. As I noted on my own exam also of DHA. So... First point is she is dehydrated. She has been in labor for already one day. Second is most of you will think fetal heart rate absent means the baby is dead. So what is the need of doing a cesarean delivery? But here the point is people that molding is present and head is plus one station. Okay, plus one. What is the final station at which you can at least put a vent tools or something to take out the baby? That is plus two station, not plus one. Molding is present that means overlapping of the fetal skull bones is there which means that the fetus was trying very hard the head was trying but it didn't happen despite molding it reached only plus one station otherwise with the extensive molding if the fetus is able to reach plus two station that means some amount of compatibility between the head and the mother's pelvis was there dirty infected discharge is present but dirty infected discharge is sign of chorioamnionitis or in full-blown infection when such a thing is there, you have to do a cesarean delivery for the mother. Now, the other options, oxytocin drip. A patient dehydrated and for in labor for so long, you can't give her the option of oxytocin drip. That means you're giving her more pain beyond this. Now, here they have written, okay, if some people will get it out, it says pelvis adequate. See, people, it is most likely a case of macrosomic baby, okay? Pelvis is adequate. That means it's a gynecoid pelvis. But the baby was big in size. That is why it could not come through. Ventus delivery. Ventus means vacuum delivery. You need a plus two station for that. And craniotomy and vaginal delivery. Now this is craniotomy is called a destructive operation in our obstetrics. For one thing, we don't do these days now at all. Even in the Middle East countries and all, you will not choose these operations. But if at all, in your exam, if it is written that baby was anomalous, head is plus two station, or they have written negative points about the baby with the absent fetal heart and the option of cesarean section is not given, then you can choose the craniotomy option because craniotomy is done only for a fetus which is dead and anomalous and the head or the presenting part should reach plus two station. Okay, so this is about the obstructed labor topic as such. And one more thing here, signs of obstruction, you know, mother will have show all the signs of dehydration. 
the vagina will have a dirty infected discharge and the, most of the times the fetal heart rate is absent because of too much of uh, pushing and the labor activity fetus is compromised okay let's go on to the next question one prophylactic dose of NTD immune globulin can prevent RHD aluminization after exposure of up to dash ML of RHD positive blood or dash ML of fetal cells. So now um, this question I'm putting here because this was a real exam question on one of the GP's exam. I think about two weeks ago, he gave me the feedback that he was asked how much uh, how much of fetal blood will be neutralized by standard dose of NTD immune globulin? Please take your time to choose the answer. Although it's a factual question, but you need to know this one for the facts. Yeah, entities, no, 300 microgram. Also, please notice the milligrams and micrograms involved. Okay. So, the answer here is A. Okay. Now, this is, I'll explain you how. The 30 ml of RHT positive blood means whole blood. Okay. Whole blood of RHT positive 30 ml. And if we talk about the fetal cells means they're talking about fetal RBCs. If it is only 15 ml of fetal RBCs, then it will be 15 ml. So, although it is a mugging apart, but please memorize this because 30 ml of whole blood and 15 ml fetal RBCs. Now, here, what is the uh, therapeutic dose of NTD which we give after delivery? It is 300 micrograms. And I, yes, doctor, I'll repeat that. Prophylactic dose means, pro, uh, see, you have to know um, at what timing this entity injection is being given. When you give after delivery, then it is full dose, 300 mcg. Half dose is 150 mcg, not 100, okay? Uh, whenever you are talked about, like, suppose um, first trimester, some amount of bleed is there, that time, all the first trimester surgery, uh, bleed or threatened abortion, or you talk about any procedure like amniocentesis, chorionic villus sampling, in whenever it is done in our NTD or sorry RH negative patient, you have to give the prophylactic dose, which is one fifty micrograms. Okay. In the options, most of the time, fifty and hundred also <clears throat> will be given as the option to confuse you. But please remember three hundred and one fifty. Now, uh, you also get sometimes, uh, for your knowledge sake, you should know, uh, because there are many, many questions which can be framed around this topic. One of the questions is that, first of all, understand the concept. You talk about RH negative patient. The first thing we should know is the husband or the partner's blood group. Okay. Because only and only if the husband or the partner is RH positive, then the whole topic or the discussion of NTD or immunization, ISO immunization should start. Suppose the patient is RH negative and the husband is RH negative, you don't have to worry about the RH ISO immunization. Okay. How it happens is patient is NT, uh, patient is D negative. If the husband is positive, what will happen? D negative means the genotype of small d and positive means one second positive means uh, or like this okay 
So whenever the capital D is there, patient will be blood group positive. Only if both are small d, then the patient is blood group negative. Now, if this is the mother and this is the father's genotype, when you have a baby, there is a 25% chance of the baby having Rh negative. If the father is this kind of uh, DD, that means all the children are going to be D positive. So, considering this in mind, we always assume that fetus is Rh positive. And Rh positive means what now? See, um, first pregnancy, patient will, patient will be pregnant first time. There are always small amount of something called fetomaternal leaks fetal maternal hemorrhage which happen at the time of pregnancy what is fetal maternal hemorrhage the fetus is connected to the mother's uh, through the placenta placenta is attached to the uterus between the placenta and uterus interface there is communication and intermixing of mother's and the baby's blood that is a time when some amount of fetal cells will diffuse into the mother's circulation okay because very big, big sinusoids are there. I don't know how many of you remember your placental anatomy or the diagram which we used to make in MBBS days. So, this fetomaternal hemorrhage or leak, this is the word which we, they use most of the time. This keeps on happening during the pregnancy. It can happen or at the time of threatened abortion when we do a procedure, invasive procedure like uh, amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling. So, these leaks can happen and to search. So, what happens? The antibodies will be formed. Now, because positive D will escape into the mother's circulation, mother's body will say, where is this D coming from? Because she herself is small D positive, right? So, they will make antibodies. Now, first time antibodies will be IgM. That is a big molecule, cannot cross the placenta. So, first baby never gets affected. Second pregnancy, now, the whole story and the whole topic we discuss is always for the second and subsequent pregnancies. Second time, what happens? Mother will again get a small leak from the fetus. This D, capital D, will come in, come in the circulation. Mother's immune system will recognize and this time they will make IgG antibodies. That's a secondary immune response. IgG is a small molecule. It crosses the placenta and after that, it will attack the fetal cells. So, fetus will have hemolysis and anemia. I hope I'm clear. If anybody has any doubt, please ask me questions later on when we are having an open chat. So fetal anemia and fetal hemolysis will happen. Now, sometimes they ask you the question, how much amount of uh, fetal leak minimum should be there to sensitize the mother's immune system to elicit a immune response? So a leak of as little as 0.1 ml is significant to elicit the response from the mother okay so please remember this i think i put it in my next slide one second I'm not able to change the slide yeah okay see indications for ntd prophylaxis there is a full list of indications that is threat threatened abortion any procedures being done Test uh, this, I will tell you later. Yeah, amount of fetal maternal hemorrhage at which women can become aluminized is approximately 0.1 ml. Second is sometimes they ask you this question within how much time you should give the anti D that 90% protection should be given to the mother for the next delivery. So, you know, you must have seen that it has to be given within 72 hours of delivery. And uh, one more question you may be asked sometime is, which is the test to detect fetal maternal hemorrhage? That is the Lehor pet k test. One moment. Where is the chat box gone? Yeah. It's KB test. Lehor pet k test. Okay. So, RH uh, negative or RH IC immunization is a very important topic on your exam. So, I have tried to tell you... Um, more if you people have any more doubts you can come and attend the subsequent classes which we take every week and you can understand it there better okay let's go on to the next one for women at higher risk of having a fetus affected with neural tube defects what is the daily recommended folic acid intake now it's again a very very common question and still people tend to get confused is it 400 microgram 4 milligram 
फोर्टी मिलीग्राम और फोर ग्राम Okay, now here see the answer is four milligram. Okay, which is called as the therapeutic dose, and it is. I'll tell you the idealness of that. These very important points were there. There is something called prophylactic dose of folic acid, and there is something called therapeutic dose. Okay. Prophylactic doses which we give to routinely all the mothers and it is 4 microgram. Okay. And profile, uh, therapeutic doses when the patient is at high risk of having neural tube defects or when the patient has history of having a previous child affected with the neural tube defect like spina bifida, meningomyelocele, Spina uh, neural tube defect would be uh, open defect or a closed defect, anything, and a patient with encephalocele. Okay, like the what is encephalocele, where the cranial vault is absent. So starting from the cranium till the spinal cord or the sacral level, if there is a defect anywhere in the spine in the bony process of spine formation, it is called as neural tube defect. Okay, so. Whenever a history like that is there or patient is at high risk, I will tell you what are the high risk factors. That is, then you require a therapeutic dose, which is 4 milligram. Okay. Or if you translate into micrograms, it will be 4000 micrograms. Now, what are the high risk factors for having neural tube defects? It is uh, diet. Um, is it diet or is it... Uh, Yes, dietary, um, less amount of folic acid, like a dietary deficiency, maternal diabetes, high maternal poor body temperature. This could be because of certain conditions, like sometimes occupation, some vocational activities of the women are like that, which will cause them to live in a very heated environment. And ethnicity, these four are the factors which have an effect on the neural tube defects. Now, there are some patients uh, who are having epilepsy disease like a epilepsy complicating pregnancy and they will be on anti-epileptics like carbamazepine. Such patients because CBZ it acts in it interferes in the metabolism of folic acid okay. It like uh, creates a block and patient will have less availability of folic acid. So even such patients should be given high folic acid or therapeutic level of folic acid. I'm telling you this because sometimes you may get a clinical vignette question in the exam which will have all the story of epilepsy and she's on this drug and they will talk, want to test you about the folic acid deficiency or high risk of neural tube defect. Okay, So please remember some of these connections. Okay, next. What is the leading cause of perinatal mortality in pregnancies complicated by pregestational diabetes? The other name of pregestational diabetes mellitus is over diabetes. So what is it? Congenital anomalies, iatrogenic preterm deliveries. Iatrogenic means the thing caused by the doctor. Like doctor only decides to deliver the patient prematurely because of some reason. Spontaneous preterm deliveries or diabetic ketoacidosis. I have put up this question because I wanted to tell you some important differentiating points of um, over diabetes and gestational diabetes. Okay. And for some reason, whenever they want to talk about anomalies, they will talk about the over diabetes. And whenever they want to ask questions upon the big baby, they will talk about GTM. 
So the differentiation of the, because as I uh, also said, one third of world population is suffering from diabetes, including the women. So nowadays, uh, women uh, in obstetrics, diabetes is a very, very important medical disorder complicating pregnancy. Okay. See, the answer here is congenital anomalies. Okay. Now, why is it so? I want to, to I want to tell you some very important differentiating points between over diabetes and the gestational diabetes. We'll have big baby, but over DM will have IUGR. Okay, why? Any anybody can say the reason because see all of you know diabetes causes vasculopathy. So over diabetic patients will have vascul vasculopathy at the level of placental vasculature also. So it will cause a utero placental insufficiency kind of situation. Baby will not get enough blood and baby will lead into IUGR. Uh, over diabetic patients do not have a big baby. Please remember that. Second thing, over diabetic patients will have more uh, risk of having congenital anomalies because of the poorly controlled glycemic levels prior to pregnancy. That is why we always say that patients when they are trying to conceive and if they are having diabetes, they should have a good glyco-HB. The cutoff should be less than 6.5% glyco-HB prior to conception and they should maintain it for at least 3 months before conceiving. Okay. This is also called as a periconceptional period. And as I told you, it's a risk factor for neural tube defects. So you also start patient on therapeutic dose of folic acid supplementation in the periconceptional period. Periconceptional. Okay. Not pre. Peri. Peri means around the time of conception. So three months around the time of conception, you have to start this folic acid also. And the most of the time, it's the um, unknown status of the patient for diabetes and high glyco and patient conceiving on that, which creates the chance of congenital anomalies. Next is um, preterm deliveries or spontaneous preterm. Uh, no, this is not the leading cause, of, although it is a possibility, but not a leading cause of perinatal mortality. And diabetic ketoacidosis also happens in patients with DM, but it's not the cause of perinatal mortality. Now I want to tell you just a word about GDM. GDM will have big baby. You know why GDMs will have big baby? It's very simple. You need to understand the loop. Um, see, all the OBG thing, it works around the concept, okay? So, see, mother will have hyperglycemia. That high glucose level will get transferred to the uh, fetus through the placenta. This will cause fetal hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia which will cause fetal hyperinsulinemia means fetus will make more insulin level yeah and more insulin will uh, going to cause fat deposit it's anabolic hormone right so it will cause fat deposition and fetuses have the tendency to deposit in the interscapular area and infrascapular area which causes shoulder dystocia in labor finally okay because the bisacromial diameter increases in size. So, it works like that. Now, this is GDM. And uh, I explained you why there is IUGR in the pregestational diabetes. Now, one more thing I wanted to tell you here. Now, in the over-diabetes patient, you will have a very common, uh, very specific anomalies related, specific to this over-DM is sacral agenesis. Okay, this is also MCQ in your exam. But in GDM patients, the most common congenital malformation they can have congenital heart disease, CHDs. Okay, these are the things. And uh, one more thing I wanted to tell you here. Yeah. yeah, and one more thing is why they say that you should switch to insulin from the oral hypoglycemic agents because one reason is the lack of teratogenicity in insulin. Second thing is insulin doesn't cross placenta. Okay, so it will not cause fetal hypoglycemia. It will only work on the mother. So I hope I'm clear to all of you in this. Yes, so you should know the differences between 
pre-gestation diabetes and the GDM. I wanted to say a word about glycohp, but we have a separate question for that. Okay, we'll see that day later. Now, in a woman on subdominal progesterone implant, implanon, the menstrual abnormality seen is what? Is it menorrhagia, metrorrhagia, polymenorrhea, or amenorrhea? Okay. I think everybody has attempted. Let me see what is the answer. See, yes, it is metrorrhagia. I wanted to explain you here. Implanon is a progesterone contraceptive device, and uh, progesterone. Con Okay, so metrorrhagia is a persistent problem. Be it LNG, I use IUCD, IUCD, or is it POPs, progesterone only pills, or a mini pill? What is that? Is the other name, or an implant on, or an or plant? Um, menorrhagia, no. In progesterone implants never cause menorrhagia. In fact, it's a treatment for menorrhagia. It doesn't cause polymenorrhea also, no heavy and frequent bleeding. And full amenorrhea doesn't happen with uh, implanon or this low, low dose of progesterone because it is always complicated by some amount of irregular bleeding. So you never get complete amenorrhea. Now see this here. This is the implanon that is a device kept here in the arm of the patient. Okay, So it releases the progesterone slowly over time and acts as a contraception. Now, this is another question. Um, you, um, urinary incontinence is a, again, very important exam topic for you all. A 70-year-old woman complains of occasional incontinence. How? She's otherwise healthy and reports that this occurs mainly at night when she awakes with the intense desire to void. And by the time she is able to get to the bathroom, she has wet herself. What is the most likely diagnosis here? Okay. Let us see the answer, what everybody has written. It is, yes, uniformly everybody is correct. So that means everybody knows the difference between stress and urinary uh, urge incontinence. See, the patient uh, will typically give the history of uh, intense desire to void. That means she is feeling the bladder sensation. And before she reaches the bathroom, she has leakage of urine or wets herself. This is a typical history or urge incontinence. The other word which you may find in your question or in the options is detrusal instability. Okay. Now, I have, just want to have a small word on the other options. Stress urinary incontinence or SUI is the most common cause of urinary incontinence. If you have that question in the exam, which of the following is the most common type? SUI makes 80% of the cases because uh, it happens due to old age, menopause. Many reasons are there. Typical cause is the estrogen deficiency. Patient will give typical history of when the intra-abdominal pressure raises on coughing or laughing or straining for stool or if she has constipation, she has involuntary leakage of urine. That is the history for SUI. Now, detrusor instability, it's the opposite of that is detrusor hypotonia. It will cause urinary retention, not incontinence. Neurogenic bladder is a condition which is seen in spinal cord related abnormalities like multiple sclerosis or in spinal cord injury. Okay, in that case, bladder discharges on its own, uh, uninhibited, un like continuous discharges, and patient will have 
we created incontinence. So patient with spinal cord injury, you know, most of them will be having diapers because they don't have control over the bladder. So I this is okay clear to all of you. Let's go on to the next one. Now this is on the antipartum hemorrhage. A mm -hmm. hypertensive pregnant woman at 34 weeks, okay, so she's preterm, comes with history of pain abdomen, bleeding PV, and loss of fetal movements. On examination, uterus is contracted with increased uterine tone, fetal heart is absent, most likely diagnosis, placenta previa, hydram polyhydramnios or hydramnios is same thing, premature labor or abruptual placenta. Okay, so here, a um, very uh, important thing to note is 34 weeks hypertension. They have already given you the clue for the associated problem. Okay, uh, here I wanted to say that answer is abruption, dead to self hypotonia. Doctor, I'll tell you after this. Okay. Uh, antipartum hemorrhage is antipartum hemorrhage. It has only two entities that is uh, and placenta previa and abruptio placenta. When I say the word antipartum, it is A and T -E, that is before labor, not A and T I. Please make a note. Partum means labor. So before labor, any bleeding happening is antipartum hemorrhage. You have placenta previa, which is very, very common, you know, low-lying placenta, it causes painless bleeding. It will never have pain. Abruption will always be painful. Okay. And hypertension is a known risk factor for abruptio because high BP is going to cause hemorrhage at the level of placenta and how much blood loss or how much placental separation should happen to cause fetal death. Up to 75% surface area of placenta should separate to cause fetal death. Okay. Now uterus is contracted with increased tone. It will be tone will be increased because the blood will seep into the uterus. Do you know the name for that? Cuvillier uterus. This is also exam question. Cuvillier uterus. That is the discal. This is the intraop finding. When you operate on a patient of abruptio and there is a discoloration noted on the serosa of the uterus. Okay, because the blood would have percolated from the endometrium, myometrium, and it reaches up to the serosal level. That is typical. In of abruptio placenta and such a uterus is called covalier uterus. Here I wanted to tell you one thing. Uh, there is an associated question with that. Patient will have pain abdomen and no obvious, yeah, here it is bleeding PV is given. In some question they will tell you that no bleeding is given but still all the features are pointing towards abruption and then the option then there will be option of concealed abruption. So, abruptio is of two types. One is concealed and one is revealed. Concealed means hidden in that the blood is collected behind the uterus, behind the placenta, sorry. Revealed is it bleeds and it comes out through the vagina and it is shown. So, patient will say painful bleeding happened. So, this is abruptio. Now, about your, um, yeah, detrusor hypotonia doctor, I was saying that uh, urge incontinence, there will be hyperactivity of detrusor muscle, which is the main muscle of the bladder, and patient will have incontinence. Hypotonia means the muscle will be quiet and uh, patient will have urinary retention. So that is the opposite of incontinence. Okay, that is the only difference. They have just put that word in the option to confuse you people. So you need to realize you can get the meaning from each and every word in the exam when they give you. Okay, now most sensitive screening test in diabetic mothers for congenital malformation is. Now, this is the one which I wanted to tell you. You have so many patients of diabetes and you everybody is worried about the risk of congenital malformation. So, which test is most specific or sensitive to pick up that thing? 
AFPs, amniotic uh, alpha fetoprotein levels. So, um, maternal serum alpha fetoprotein levels or amniotic fluid AFP levels. I think it's a very simple question. Most of you will know the answer. It's very, very predictive of congenital malformations. Okay, people, it's a... Uh, now, see, the answer for this is glyco-HB, okay? Glyco-HB nowadays, it's a very, very uh, um, sensitive screening test for detecting the risk of congenital malformation. Yes, I know. Uh, 6.5 is the cutoff to have the ideal birth. Okay, if you are less than six, you are not diabetic. I think I am right about that. So, uh, now more than 6.5 to 7.5, it is a high risk for having diabetes, and it is over diabetes. More than 7.5 to 8.5, the risk of having congenital malformation in, even increases more. But when it becomes 10 percent glycohp. 30 or to 40 percent of the pregnancies will definitely have congenital malformations. Okay, and more than 10 percent glycohp. If we find, we should tell the patient to terminate the pregnancy, go have a glucose control, and maintain it for three months. Then try to conceive because in such cases you are definitely going to have a abnormal fetus. Okay, so this is the importance of doing HbA1c. Uh, not the blood glucose levels, they are very fluctuating and not the AFP levels also. So, ma'am, what's the answer? HbA1c is the answer? Yes, glycosylated H hemoglobin is the answer here, HbA1c. Is okay. fetal termination legal in Dubai? Uh, yeah, now this thing, uh, as far as the Middle East countries are concerned, only and only if there is an obvious risk to the fetus, you have to terminate the pregnancy. Otherwise, it is not allowed. Like routine abortions are not allowed. But yes, if it is an anomalous fetus, which is uh, risky to the family or not compatible with life or suffering from many anomalies, then it is allowed. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Now, last question for today. This is also a very interesting question, which will be most of the time seen on your exam. They are very fond of this also. A 27-year-old woman, G2P2, comes to physician to have her staples removed after an uncomplicated elective repeat cesarean delivery. Since delivery, she has noticed some episodes of sadness and tearfulness. Otherwise, she is normal. Which of the following is most likely diagnosis? So, psychiatric issues in postnatal mothers is a very uh, favorite topic in the exam. There are only three conditions. I will okay rule out one for you. Maternity blues, depression, and psychosis. Schizophrenia is not seen in the postpartum period like that. So, apart in these three, you have to differentiate uh, the three. It is very, very important. And it's a clinical diagnosis. So, what do you think? Okay, everybody has attempted very fast. Yes. The answer is maternity blues. Also maternity blues, yes. Yes, it is blues because, see, um, that's what I was telling once also to my, my regular class people. Uh, the main difference between the three conditions is the, uh, the timing after delivery when it happens or when it starts. And the second is the uh, this very specific symptoms. Now, the blues, it happens typically within the first one week to 10 days. See, here they have not given you the duration, but they have given you a hint that she came to her physician to re remove the staples. Usually, we remove the stitches or staples on the seventh post-op day. Okay, so it is within one week. She is saying she has uh, tearfulness and sadness. This is a typical history of maternity blues. Depression is patient will have insomnia, inability to sleep, that is, and patient will have um, repeated apprehension. She keeps on checking on the baby if everything is all right, okay? That is called as postpartum depression, and she will have very uh, strong mood liability that she will have crying episodes. She will not get proper sleep, you know, all the severe symptoms, but it usually starts after one week or 10 days. So you have a cutoff. Within one week or 10 days, if it happens and the symptoms are mild, it is Blues. Okay, blues is a very light word. Okay. 
depression you need not give patient any treatment she will come out of it within next two weeks depression if it is there she will have lack of sleep or insomnia she will have repetitive baby checking behavior or checking the nappy of the baby like that kind of behavior now last one is psychosis this is a very uh, serious condition usually happens after three weeks of the delivery and it is sudden in onset okay patient will have baby harming behavior in that okay baby harming means we actually had a patient when where i was working their patient actually tried to harm the baby that is killing the baby or smothering like putting a pillow on the baby's face or sometimes they throw the baby from the bed that kind of behavior they have but and psychosis comes suddenly patient will have some antecedent history of uh, psychiatric abnormality in the uh, time period preceding pregnancy okay so some history like that will be there and it comes suddenly so in such psychosis patients you have to separate the baby and the mother and you have to hospitalize the patient to give a serious treatment schizophrenia doesn't happen okay we have a last question here i forgot triple test includes now this one is also very very important so i thought i should add this question this is also kind of mugging up question but uh, it is important for you people see for the down syndrome screening you have double test triple test quadruple test okay double means two markers you are checking triple means three markers and quadruple means four markers you are checking so every time one marker will increase now triple test dual marker will be if you want to attempt dual marker is pap a and hcg triple test yes whoever has attempted the answer is right a maternal serum afp hcg and unconjugated estriol okay e3 is estriol this one also i was telling um okay and the quadruple test is all the, these three afp hcg unconjugated estriol plus inhibin a sorry inhibin a or b i forgot right now inhibin b i guess okay now here some important things please remember it is estriol or e Three, not E two or E one. Okay, what is the difference? Estrogen in women is of three types: estrone, Ist okay, that is E one; estradiol, diol is two, so E two; and estriol is three, that is E three. Now, estrone is seen in um, adolescent girls less than eighteen years old. At that time, it is the predominant estrogen. Estradiol is the major estrogen of reproductive age. It continues throughout the reproductive age. And estriol, it is typically seen in menopausal women, that is after menopause. Mm -hmm. And also, it is produced by placenta during pregnancy. Okay, that is why unconjugated estriol, it's a marker which is included in the triple test screening. It is made by placenta alone. Okay, so anyways, I this is there's a lot of research involved in this. Is why they chose these three markers. You don't have to go into that. Your job is only to mark up these three things. So, PAP A is a marker of a uh, double marker. Okay, mm -hmm. and it is full form is pregnancy associated plasma protein A. And uh, TSH has got no role in the Down syndrome screening. So, don't ever get confused with this. So, yeah, this is it. And uh, Ma'am, what is the difference between the AFP levels in uh, castor crisis and uh, Down syndrome, ma'am? Okay, good one. See, um, gastros crisis and Down syndrome. Okay, for that I will tell you one more thing. Testing window of these tests. Okay, dual marker. I'll take up the questions one by one. Yeah, dual marker is eleven weeks but to fourteen weeks time. Triple test is fourteen. Um, one second, fourteen to sixteen weeks, and um, 
sorry, triple test is 16 to 18 weeks, okay, not 14. That is, what test is more than 18 weeks, okay. Now, why these three different tests, three different timings? Because it depends when the patient is presenting to you, okay. When the patient is coming on the correct time, uh, timely checkups, you have always opportunity to do a dual marker, early testing. And sometimes we do, this is called as sequential test. That is, you do double test, then you do triple test also. Uh, this we do in very, very high-risk patients where either the maternal age or patient is very apprehensive that because of her, uh, any past history of having a Down's baby or in the family, they're very apprehensive. So they are not satisfied alone with one test what then we can do a sequential test do a double test and then you can do a quadruple test also okay not the triple one you can do a quad test directly okay now somebody asked me something um between castor crisis and uh, down syndrome are uh, the different in hp levels ah uh, yes 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 okay see first of all you should know the down syndrome uh, this biochemistry, how do you decide? I have taught in my regular class also. HCG will be high. Okay. Yes. So you have to remember H and H. H for HCG, H for high. So remaining two parameters of the triple test will be low AFP and remaining to a low HCG. But in gastroschisis, this is ulta, high HCG. Oh, sorry. No, no, sorry, sorry, wait. Got confused here. Low AFP and low e estriol in gastroschisis it will be high afp and there is one more reason why it should be high see in gastroschisis there is some amount of communication and afp starts diffusing out through the uh, the fetal structures to the amniotic fluid and through the amniotic fluid it goes towards the mother circulation. So when you're talking about the AFP level, it is maternal serum AFP. Okay. In gastroschisis, it is high and it is downs, it is low. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, you're welcome. So any other questions, please ask. Now, my PPT questions are over. So, won't the uh, NT scan eliminate downs? Okay, good question. See, doctor, uh, one more thing here. When we talk about a screening test, screening test is a test which detects as having the chances of having a disease. It is not a diagnostic test. Whenever you get a positive risk for screening test, you proceed to the diagnostic test. Okay, whenever you get Anti scan is done from 11 weeks to 13 weeks, 6 days. That is less than 14 weeks, 6 days. When a, what is a diagnostic test for uh, Downs or any other abnormality? That is amniocentesis followed by fetal karyotype. Okay, you have to have fetal karyotype to demonstrate that the fetus has 321 uh, chromosome. T21, that is a trisomy 21, and that is how you are going to tell that it is a Down's baby. This is how the confirmation is done. High NT is only a risk factor. But the question yeah. comes, why do you want to screen so much? The reason is, as I told in my regular classes also, because Down's, uh, having a Down's baby is a huge, tremendous pressure on the mother as well as the parents, society, everything. Why you should uh, why you should have such a burden when in the test when the disease is detectable and if it is positive it's better to terminate the pregnancy. Why to have a crippled or a challenged child to come and live in the society? That is the reason why this whole thing is done. And another thing, why Down syndrome only? Because this is the only trisomy which is compatible with life. It is born and it is lives. Some of the Down's people will live up to 60, 70 also. So. You know, uh, that is why the science has made it like they are not able to have anything. It adds to the morbidity and to burden to the society. So better not to have such children in society. So double marker <clears throat> is also done in the same window. Yes, people, double marker and NT are done together. It is called NT and B scan. 
mucal transmissions in nasal bone scan absent nasal bone is a is a is a feature of uh, down syndrome again rh isomerization amount of blood neutralized yes that is 300 microgram dose will neutralize 30 ml of whole blood and half of the you can just remember half of the fetal rbcs Okay, no problem, people. So we'll stop sharing this. Yeah, thank you very much, madam. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. A lot of learning for me <laughs> in gynec. So I'm listening. <laughs> yeah, improving my gynec part. <laughs> I didn't really. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not uh, good in guidance. No, sir, but I, I didn't realize you were there. No, no, I'm absolutely here. From first line to last line, I'm here. So I'm <laughs> I'm not a good fellow to okay. comment. So I'm just learning. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you very much, madam. So we'll see again. You can just share your, uh, stop share your screen. Yes. So I'll just end the class and yes. uh, I mean make a recording. So we can... Procure okay, to all the students. Maybe by evening we will get ready this recording. Yes, so we'll begin. Okay. Thank you very much all for joining. Please post your feedback of Madam and uh, today's class, and we'll see you next Sunday. Thank you very much. Keep in touch and do let me know or Madam any query, concern, questions. Her number is also there. Probably I'll share it. Uh, would you mind, Madam, if I share your number in group? Uh, yes, sir. You can share. No problem. It's there in the group also. You yeah, but share. somebody no, no, no. doesn't have, there are a lot of people. No? So I'll share yeah, Madam's yes. number for any gynec queries, you better uh, this thing. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy your Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.